So instead of talking about overcoming natural constraints, I'd rather talk about living within natural constraints. And so here is really not about that we're going to have some kind of mindset that, oh, we can you know, trample nature, we can, we can control it, we can do all sorts of things, but really is to say, how do I actually live within it? Because if I don't have to expend energy you know, taming nature, I can use that energy for other parts of my innovation, other maybe more important parts of the innovation. So if I can understand how to live within it, I might have a better chance of getting my innovation real, getting my innovation uh, produced and adopted uh, in the world. So one thing is to use what's available. If there are materials around that we might be able to use. In some developing countries, uh, to, to, to irrigate fields, what farmers might do is go buy a, a diesel-powered pump and try to come up with a diesel somewhere to be able to run that pump. And so a pump is very, very expensive. It's handlessly expensive. It required many months of a family's wages. And then also, where do you get the diesel from? So the diesel has to be brought in from far, far away, especially if you're in a rural area like this. And so what Paul Pollock came up with, and Paul Pollock wrote a book, Out of Poverty, where he describes this, and he describes his company, IDE, International Development um, Enterprises. And they developed this $20 pump that was actually human-powered. And so in these places where they don't have a lot of diesel sitting around, they certainly have a lot of people sitting around. And so we made this pump. It's basically a cast iron pump, and it has to put two bamboo poles in, and you're able to use, like, you do the stepmaster motion, which uses the big muscles in your legs instead of the small muscles in your arms to pump this thing. It's, and it, and by, because of leverage, when you put these, uh, let me show you a picture one, by way of leverage, you can actually have small children. You know, kids can do this and, and, and pump fluid in just as good a way as the diesel engine can and do it at a price that is actually affordable, and that actually works within that contest. So again, using what you have at hand can be an important thing. My next piece of advice is to come in from the wind and rain. And so here really to think about, what it, when I cite my area for transformation, so I have an uh, innovation that's going to be produced or going to make something somewhere, how do I think about where I put it? You know, these things, like I said before, tornadoes, earthquakes, fires, floods, avalanches, all those things are going to happen. And so let me think about them ahead of time and say, to what extent are these going to be problematic for me? In the tsunami in Japan in 2011, there was a big problem because here's a picture of a clean room, the, the, the one uh, on this side, a picture of a clean room where they're making computer chips. And the problem with computer chips is a very time-dependent, sequence-dependent uh, process that is, cannot be interrupted. And when power went out and when the floods came in, that the process was interrupted and they lost millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of production that was in process because of this. And so we don't think about if I have a process that's super susceptible or super vulnerable to that kind of thing, how do I think about where it is I want to put that process? And so this is something important to think about. If I'm, it goes from anywhere from baking bread, if you need a certain level of humidity and things like that, where can you put it to is something as complex as making computer chips? In her book, Biomimicry, Janine uh, Bynas, in 1997, she wrote a book uh, that described how it is that we might use models in nature, we can, might mimic things in nature, she called it biomimicry, mimic things in nature to create new innovations that actually work to sustain life and sustain it in a way that's consistent or that's more um, easy on the world. So take this example of a termite mound. This is a gigantic termite mound. Uh, these things are tall and high. And one question has always been, how do these things cool themselves? Because there's a lot of insects in here, and they're in really hot places, and this thing is sticking up in the air, a place often where there's not a lot of wind. How do they cool themselves? Well, through careful study, some people figured it out. And in fact, uh, Mick Pierce, an architect in Harare, Zim in Harare Zimbabwe, he created this building, this Eastgate, this Eastgate office building, the Eastgate Center. And this building, because of the way it's designed, it uses the cooling, the ideas of how a termite mound cools itself, is able to use 90% less energy for ventilation than other buildings of comparable size. And so that's pretty amazing, 90% less energy just by having modeled it on a termite mound. And probably is, inside it probably is like a termite mound if you think of any high-rise building full of little people scurrying about, uh, has that, that sense. Another thing we might do is get smart about our supply chain, that is uh, understanding when people, where it is we put the outputs in a way that actually is helpful. Starbucks, you know, Starbucks, they make a lot of coffee, and a lot of coffee throws off a lot of coffee grinds. And the coffee grinds really are not um, that useful to them, and it's something that they probably would have to pay to have taken away. One thing they do is they put a, often there's a little basket inside the Starbucks where they put the coffee grinds, the used coffee grinds. They put them in these big bags, and as a customer, you're just able to grab a bag or grab five bags, grab whatever, and take it home and use this compost. So you can spread it out in your garden. It's actually a very healthy uh, kind of compost. And so what they're doing is they're able to take this thing that's normally a waste, a waste product, and get the customers to take it with them. And that is actually very 
You know, that's, a, that's good thinking because they're able to get the waste product out of their store and get it to a place where it's actually much more useful than had they trucked it off into a big landfill somewhere where it wasn't actually be able to use as a compost, as a this real high value thing. And from the customer's perspective, the customer also gets access to compost, to this composting material, and doesn't have to go buy some more themselves. And so there's a, a virtuous cycle in there uh, through that whole thing. Another example like that is with Martin Guitar Company, and then their participation in the Smartwood program. Martin joined the Smartwood Consortium, and what the Smartwood Consortium does is they certify the use of woods, so basically hardwoods, inside of, of companies. And what they certify is that the wood will be sustainably harvested, uh, fairly purchased and, and, and bought and, and, and used and, and, and audited through its life cycle. The value to Martin is, first of all, there are some people who play guitars who actually care about the environment and who like to see this, and those are people who are set up in this way uh, um, emotionally, and they're going to pay more money for one of these guitars, and these guitars probably start at like $3,000. The other thing that it does is it ensures for Martin that they actually have a sustainable wood supply, because if they know that the wood supply is that they are buying these certified trees and they're sustainably grown, that they're going to be around for a long time, they'll be able to get access to these, and so with their factory, they're not going to be likely to idle it. That is, you have these high paid, highly skilled craftspeople who build these guitars and the worst possible problem you could have is have a bunch of people sitting around but no wood. And so by sustainably going the wood you ensure that you have a nice supply chain and by doing the smart wood part it actually helps the customers, the kind of customers that you'd want to buy your products and so it becomes a virtuous cycle there as well. So why are some things just hard? Well, it may have to do with the ecology of it, because of the distribution of the natural resources and our ability to sustain life within the context of that our innovation is occurring. To wrap this week up on technological constraints, let me just leave with an example uh, that harkens back to the one from last week. Last week we talked about the Segway and about this sort of this idea of the self-balancing scooter. Well, I ran across this interesting article where written by uh, Trevor Blackwell, who makes a website where he, he chronicles his building of one of these self-balancing scooters. And, he, by the end, he said he spent about uh, 5000 bucks. He spent about uh, a week. He spent another week tweaking it and writing it up, but basically spent a week making this thing happen. So clearly, here's a case, unlike the A12, where technological constraints were not the problem. And often, we want to jump right to technological constraints, especially if we're oriented as an engineer. We think of ourselves as you know, sort of a technical person. Um, often, the technology is, is concrete. It's easy. We can test whether it's working or not. And it's a lot easier to sort of jump into than it is to deal with the human aspects of the constraints that we're talking about. So again, so don't be tricked and don't just jump right into thinking that every problem is a technological problem. But this is not to say that, not every prob that every problem is not a technological problem as well. And so here again, we require a little bit of judgment that we have to actually use our brains to figure out, is this a constraint that we suffer from given the innovation we're trying to do or not? So ultimately, these kind of constraints, why some things are hard, they're hard because physics, because we don't know how to manage matter, we don't know how to make matter behave, because of time, because we may not have time, we may not have windows of opportunity, we may think of time in the wrong way inside of our organization, in, in unproductive ways, and then because of ecology, because there's not a good place to get the inputs we need, there's not a good place to do the transformation we need, and there's not a good place for the outputs, both the valued outputs and also the byproducts of what it is we're producing in terms of our innovation. And to all the open source people who've given me lots of images that I can use in my class.